to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation to all who believe. Romans chapter 1, verse number 16. Welcome today to our study of the use and inspiration of God's Holy Word. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit them. If you've never attended the Assembly of the Church of Christ, we encourage you to do that. You'll find people there who love God's Word, are concerned about lost souls, and who want to let this book, the Bible, be our final authority. At the Gospel of Christ, we'd also love to help you in your study of the Bible itself. You can visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com where you'll find a host of free Bible study materials. You can go to our media request page and there you can request a free DVD or CD of today's lesson or any of our lessons. We'll send those to you free of charge. We'll even cover the shipping to do that. And if you've got a Bible question or you want to study God's Word further, We'd love to help you in any way in your journey as you come to know the will of the Lord better in your life. How well are we really using the Bible in our lives? And when we study the Bible, when we listen to gospel preaching, when one watches it maybe on television, do you have your Bible handy to check what you're hearing. You know, sometimes people will even go to worship without bringing their Bible with them. Friend, the Bible is our guide. It's our sole authority. It's our voice from God on how to live. It's the Christian's sword of the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And in every area where religious matters are discussed, I need to bring my Bible and use it correctly to please God and to make sure I'm doing what He wants me to do. You know, I'm reminded of that example. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, the Bible says of the Bereans, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they searched the script, they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. When somebody brought them a message from God, they had their Bible handy. They heard that message. They listened carefully. They wanted to know what the will of the Lord is, but they didn't take man's word. They used the Bible, the Scriptures, to check what they were hearing. You know, sometimes as we think about using our Bible, bringing our Bible, having our Bible handy, sometimes we're not often doing that. And so one of the things we think about is if we're not using our Bible like we ought to, why are we not? Well, sometimes people will say, well, I just forgot to bring my Bible. I didn't have it handy. We need to get in the habit of making sure that we take our Bible and that we use it correctly. Maybe somebody's not in the habit of doing that. Friend, you couldn't start a better habit than taking your Bible with you wherever you go. Maybe somebody says, well, I don't have a Bible. Well, you can sure get one at a very low price. You could find one. If you'd like to have a Bible, we'd love to help you in getting one as well. That wouldn't be hard to do at all. They're in various forms and formats, and you can get a good Bible. But you know, sometimes it is we just don't make it a priority. Maybe I was running late and I left it on the table and didn't get out and I didn't have my Bible handy or maybe I was too busy. Friends, sometimes we just got to slow down and think about what the real priorities in this life are. Jesus asked two rhetorical questions. In Mark chapter 8 verse 36 and 37 Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what? 
shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If this book is the guide for the soul, if this book tells me how my soul can be right with God and get to heaven, friend, I want to treasure it. I want to take it with me. I don't want to use excuses. I want to let the Word of God have its proper place and priority in my life. But as we think about the idea of using the Bible, having the Bible handy, being ready when religious matters come up to have my Bible close so I can use it, friend, this is indeed a biblical idea. Let me illustrate. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 21, the Apostle Paul in writing to the church at Thessalonica said, Prove all things, hold fast, that which is good. Now, when matters come up religiously, and maybe somebody's teaching one thing, maybe somebody's teaching another, or maybe I'm hearing something and I'm wondering to myself, is that really what God says? How do you prove what God says? How do you prove and hold fast that which is good? If I'm to prove all things, that suggests there is a, something I prove it by. There is a standard that I use. And friend, for sure that's the case, and it is the Word of God. How do I know this is the standard? Listen to the words of Jesus. John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my words, has that which judges him. What is it, Jesus? The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. What's the standard? It's the words of Christ. A great judgment scene, Revelation 20. Verses 12 through 15, you've got the dead, small and great, standing before God. Books were open and another book is open, which is the book of life. Friend, I will assure you, compared with the book of life is also the Word of God and those two harmonize, ought to harmonize for those who are trying to please the Almighty. And so, I've got to prove all things. Nothing wrong with that. That's what God wants me to do. Give you another passage that illustrates the idea of one using their Bible and having it handy when religious matters are discussed is 2 Timothy 2.15. The Apostle Paul said these words to a young evangelist Timothy. Paul said, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Friend, if I'm going to know how to use the Bible, I've got to study it. I've got to rightly divide it. I've got to give ample attention to it. And when matters come up of a religious nature, here's the best question you could ask. Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, 17. Paul repeated that in Romans 4, verse 3, when he asked, what does the Scripture say? And so as we think about using the Bible, that's really what we're talking about. Is there any word from the Lord? What does the Scripture say? What's God's voice on the matter? And what can I do to really make sure I'm pleasing Him? I remind you again of another example. In Acts chapter 17 verse 11, probably one of the clearest to show these people knew it was a need, they had it ready, and they were ready to use their Bible. Paul comes to the region of Berea. And the Bereans are more noble-minded, the Bible says, than those in Thessalonica. But here's what happened. Paul comes to Berea. In essence, Paul knocks on the door. He says, I've got a message about Christ. They didn't slam the door in his face. They said, Paul, come in, sit down, tell us about it. They received the word with all readiness. They were ready to hear it. And so Paul began to preach to them about Jesus. He began to tell them about how Christ is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And as they're sitting there, they're, they're listening intently. They, they're taking notes. They're writing these things down. They listen closely. And did they automatically accept it when Paul was through? No, here's what they did. They said, Paul, you've said a lot of interesting things today. We've heard what you had to say. We took notes. Now we're going to check it and see. They searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What if those people weren't familiar? What if they didn't even have a Bible? What if it wasn't handy? Might have been a whole different scenario. But they were ready to search and to prove and to see these things were indeed true from the Almighty. Now, we want to give today some encouragements, some positive reasons to have your Bible handy, to be ready to use it, and, and each of these will only benefit you as a child of God as you have your Bible ready to use. 
The first is this. You want to be ready to use your Bible because the Bible is our sword of the Spirit. Ephesians 6 verse 17, As I do battle against the evil one, Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 17, As I contend earnestly for the faith, Jude verse 3, As I fight the inward struggles that we all fight, I need to be armed. I need to be equipped. And friend, the Bible is our sword. It's our weapon. It's our tool. It's our defense. It's that which helps us to ward off the temptations and the onslaught of the evil one. But not only is it your sword of the spirit, the Bible is your mirror of the soul. James 1 pictures this. In verses 22 through 25, the scripture says that no one who looks into the mirror looks into it, walks away and immediately forgets who he was. And then he says, we look into the perfect law of liberty. We can see ourselves. We can see what God really wants us to see. How's the Bible like a mirror? Think about this. You wake up in the morning and you go to the bathroom and you look in the mirror. And things aren't quite like you'd want them to be for the day. Maybe there's hair out of place. Maybe you need to clean your face. Maybe you need to touch things up. What do you do in a mirror? You notice things that are out of place. You notice maybe things that are not right. You look at that, you compare it to the way you want it to be, and you make adjustments. Now you think about that in a spiritual sense. If this book, the Bible, is the mirror of my soul, of who I am spiritually, I can look into it, I can read it, I can study it, and I can know what I look like in a spiritual sense. I'll assure you some people weren't doing that. In Jesus' day, and here's how you know. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the Jewish hypocrites who thought they were everything spiritually but weren't, Jesus said, you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful and ornate on the outside, but inside, spiritually, you're full of dead men's bones. But not only is it our sword, not only is this book your mirror of the soul, this book is where the power is. Hebrews 4 verse 12, listen to this. The Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, joint tomorrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Remember Romans 1 16? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why not, Paul? It's the power of God unto salvation. Friend, you could find no more powerful book than the Word of God. It has the power to save, the power to heal, the power to help those who are spiritually hurting and in need. But then let me offer this reason. Why do you want to have your Bible handy and ready to use? This book is spiritual soul food. Matthew 4 verse 4, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 5 verse 6, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Spiritual soul food. This is what my soul needs to survive, to grow, to flourish. If I'm going to be what God wants me to be, I've got to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, 2 Peter 3. I've got to, as a newborn babe, desire the pure milk of the Word that I may grow thereby spiritual food and then we mention this the bible is such an important tool because it's like a hammer that has the ability to break that hard shell you ever got the milk out of a coconut before you tap a little hole in it and all the milk drains out but how are you going to get inside that coconut to get the coconut itself out well there's about only one way to do that you've got to take a hammer You've got to break that open. That hard shell has to be cracked, has to be broken before you can get to that which is good. Friend, when we talk about the Bible as a hammer, it has the ability to break open the hard heart. Jeremiah 23 verse 29, God says, Is not my word like a hammer and like a fire? And so when I think about the word of God, it has the power to pierce the heart. It has the power to break open that shell. Think about these examples. The Bible is also our light. Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. In a world of, of, of darkness, evil, and wickedness, John 3, verses 17 through 19, I can have the light of life 
through Jesus our Lord and Savior who is the light. John 8 verse 12. And friend, then we mention this. You want to have your Bible handy. You want to have it ready because as a tool, it has truth. It is the truth. Do you remember the words of Jesus in John 8 verse 32? Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. What do you mean truth? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, verse 17. This book is what God wants us to know. It's the truth about how I got here. It's the truth about what I ought to do while I'm here. And ultimately, it is the one and only true way to get to heaven. Now, we've talked a lot about different tools and different uses of the Bible. And here's how I often think about it. One of the things I like to do is collect knives. I have a whole bunch of knives, different shapes, different sizes. Some hold sentimental value. Some are useful. I've got everyday pocket knives. I've got skinning knives. I've got a whole bunch of knives. But the one knife that the Bible reminds me of, and I hope you'll understand the way I'm saying this, is the multi-tool. You can take a multi-tool and on the end it's liable to be a needle nose pliers. It may have eight or ten pieces inside of it. As you open it up, it'll have a screwdriver, it'll have a flathead, it'll have a Phillips, it'll have a can opener. I've got a pair that's got scissors, that has a knife, that has a, just a hole. Some you can take and strike and make fire with. A multi-tool is a marvelous invention when it comes to the knife. Friend, the Bible is your spiritual multi-tool in the sense that it has so much benefit and value that you can hardly begin to understand just how much it affects one's life. Why else should a person have their Bible handy and ready to use? Here's why, friend. Because we live, listen carefully, we live in a day and age when we are blessed to have the Word of God in portable form. Here's what I mean by that. You go back centuries and you go back in time and you, trans, tra, you go back in the ages, maybe a few generations, maybe even 500 years from now. Did everybody have a copy of the Bible like you and I have? Hasn't always been the case. In fact, history reveals for us that the Bible that most people had would actually be chained to a pulpit, might be in a cathedral somewhere. And you can imagine if there were one in the region and everybody had to go there for it, how that would create problems and how less access people would have. When somebody came and said something from the Bible, they might not have it handy and ready to check. It's a wonderful privilege today to have the Word of God in bound form. Do we realize what a blessing it is? I can hold within my hand the Word of God. You know, we have the Bible in so many forms today. You've got little New Testaments. You've got little Bibles that contain both the Old and New Testament. You've got beautiful bindings of it in various forms. You can have it, you can listen to it on audio. You can even uh, get forms of it where you can have it on your phone and on your tablet, download apps for that. You think of a way that the Bible, a media is available, and you can associate the Bible with that. We're living in a day and age where there's never been more access to the Word of God. And yet, friend, I want you to listen real carefully. In the book of Amos, God said... There's a drought in the land, not for food. There's a famine in the land, not of food and not of water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. Friend, with a day and age where there's so much availability to the Bible, isn't it amazing that there's also a lack of understanding by a lot of folks about the Bible and people just take what they hear and sometimes tr trust what others say. And, and you know, you want to trust people and you want to believe them, but listen carefully. This is your soul we're talking about. You need to take advantage of the fact that we do have ready access to the Bible and you need to use that for what God wants you to use it for. We also mentioned that the Bible is such a, a wonderful tool to have handy and ready for this reason. The Bible allows you to make up your own mind for yourself. Part of the problem that occurred throughout history is that people were told what to believe. Some may have been told back in the early centuries of, of the era now that we're living in that, you know, the Pope may have stood up and said, this is what you're to believe. And people just lock, stock, and barrel bought into that. Come down the history of time and great religious leaders have told people, 
You believe this and people just buy into it. I'll give you an example today. Billy Graham has gone around the country and told people just to say the sinner's prayer and everything will be okay. Do you know you can't find that prayer anywhere in your own Bible? Not like he says it. You don't find that in the Bible. Where's that at? Friend, the reason we encourage people to have their Bible handy, to be ready to check things is, if I've got my Bible ready, then it allows me to make up my mind for myself. Here's why that's important. Did you know that really and ultimately you're the only person who will be accountable for your soul? Romans 14, 12 says, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. If I'm going to be accountable for my soul, if I'm going to have to stand there and give an account for what I believe and how I've lived, then I'll for sure want to let the Bible, not somebody else, make up my mind for me. I love the example of Saul of Tarsus. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, Saul is traveling down the road to Damascus. Now, he has intentions, and he has been wreaking havoc on the church. He has intentions of dragging men and women to prison, snuffing out this idea of Jesus and Christianity, and along the way, Christ appears to him. And Saul realizes that this is not something he can take lightly. And so he asks this question. He hears the voice of Jesus, and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? Can you find a better question than that? What would the Lord have you to do? You know, the only way to answer that is for you and for me to get out our own Bibles and make up our mind for ourselves. Isn't that what the questions of Jeremiah 37, 17 and Romans verse 4 are teaching us? Is there any word from the Lord? Well, how do I know if there is? Got to check it. What does the Scripture say? Well, how do I know what the Scripture says? I've got to check it for myself. And you know what's great is when I read the Bible for myself, when I, when I see what God teaches me and what God wants me to do, I don't believe it because somebody told me I have a personal vested interest and ownership in that because, hey, I opened my own Bible. I saw it. I read it. I, I know this is from God. And because God said it and I believe God, I now have a personal investment and attachment and ownership to that idea. And how wonderful it is when someone can make the truth their own and live their life by it every day. But, you know, another reason we mention that you want to bring your Bible, and especially when it comes to things like going to worship or, you know, wherever it may be, going to hear a gospel meeting, going to hear someone preach or going to worship. You want to bring your Bible because it allows you to participate in worship. Think of the words of Jesus in John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. How does God want me to worship in spirit and in truth? I not only want to have my, my heart, my emotion, my mind engaged, I've got to let the truth guide what we do. If God's Word is truth, and it is, John 17, verse 17, I need to bring my Bible so that I can participate in worship. You know, if you just sit there like the old proverbial lump on a log, how do you think God feels about that? If when the Bible is read, your mind's somewhere else. If during the preaching, you're just kind of off in another land. If when things are taught, you don't know whether it's true or not, and you're just taking it like stock and barrel, is that what God wants me to do? No, God wants me to participate. And part of participating is, I'm going to bring my Bible, I'm going to check it for myself, and I'm going to make sure that's what's right. Now, friend, we mentioned this last point, and I know we've kind of talked around this a little bit, but we really want to drive this home. Listen very carefully, please. When religious matters are discussed and when things are brought up, and especially wherever it may be when one is going to worship or whatever, take your Bible with you to check it. Listen very carefully. The Bible says that there are a host of, of false teachers out there and I have a responsibility to make sure what I'm being taught is true. 
The Bible says in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 4, Test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For, listen now, many false prophets have gone out into the world. We're not condemning everybody as a false prophet. That's not the idea. That's not even the point here. The point is, you have to check for yourself. You have to make sure, is this person teaching truth? Is what they're, listen to this, is what they're saying about salvation coming from this book? Or is it just an emotional tug on your heart as what we're doing in worship? Is that authorized by the Bible? Or is that what man throughout the centuries has taught? Remember, only the Bible can be our real guide in what we say or do. When moral issues arise, whether it be abortion, whether homosexuality, whether it be whatever moral issue, am I listening to the Bible? Am I checking it by the truth of God's Word? Remember, God wants us to search the Scriptures daily to see if this, these things are true to the will of God and pleasing to the Almighty. Friend, as we think today about using our Bible, we're simply trying to encourage people to go back to the Bible, to, to let Jesus really have all authority, Matthew 28, verse 18, to do as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, if it's not written, we're not going to believe that, and to not add to or take away from the Word of God. And we make this passionate appeal because so many folks are being led down the spiritual road to destruction. And all they've got to do is get out their Bible and check it for themselves. Here's the challenge we make. Next time you go somewhere to worship, next time there's a religious discussion, be sure and bring your Bible. And when someone says something, if they don't say, here's where that is in the Bible, and if when they do say you can't find that, you say, wait a minute. Where are you teaching that from in Scripture? You say, hold on now, you've said this, show me in the Bible where that's right. And if that can't be produced, friend, you need to make some changes in who you're following and what you're believing because we only want to follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you've never obeyed the gospel, if you've never become a Christian, friend, we encourage you today, if you've heard the word, you believe in Jesus, you're willing to repent of sin and confess His name before men. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. We encourage you, check your Bible, see if that's not true. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.